I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, recent work that we have on uh, modeling um, boundary rationality from a differential perspective. There probably, I guess, a little bit of different uh, perspective than in some of the other talks, um, and maybe a little different style talk. So hopefully that's um, uh, you know appreciated. Uh, okay. So um, just as a little bit of motivation about the kinds of things that, you know, we think about in my group um, is, uh, you know, trying to understand how to model good predictive models for human behavior uh, in the context of, uh, say, human machine interaction or um, other multi-agent reinforcement uh, learning settings where humans might be one of the agents interacting with other algorithms and things. Um, and so this is sort of to, a little bit different than trying to come up with a, an explanatory model uh, that's also important and of interest, uh, but we're you know, largely thinking about how to come up with predictive models that we can then integrate with existing um, uh, reinforcement learning and other types of learning uh, paradigms. And so just with that context, I want to you know, kind of talk a little bit about where we're coming from. Um, and so on the one hand, you have these sort of traditional game theoretic models, um, you know, kind of setup of um, having a rational utility maximization model for the human. Uh, and that's been sort of uh, enriched with behavioral models from economics and psychology, psychology which allow for uh, having, um, say, some probabilistic priors uh, that humans use when making decisions or reference points, or even um, you know, making decisions differently under different uh, risk setups. So that's all sort of captured in this uh, you know, line of work. On the, on the other side of the coin, you have this approach um, for modeling human decision maker in partic particular for uh, financial decisions using um, what's called neuroeconomics. So you just want to have predictions of behavior purely from neurological signals um, that are uh, captured while having humans make decisions in, say, for intertemporal um, decision making or decisions uh, when faced with some risky uh, outcome. And so what we've been trying to think about is this space in between. So how to blend together these, uh, you know, kind of rich behavioral economics and game and game theory models, along with incorporating physiological uh, signals and, you know, hope, hopefully ultimately neurological signals as well into the, this uh, model of uh, how to get a good predictive model for uh, human decision making. And so this one line of work that we have <clears throat> recently is um, on coming up with a way to think about bounded rationality from a differential perspective. And by that, I mean, we're literally capturing sort of how people make decisions just using derivatives or what, what's called conjectural variations. And so this is work with um, my colleague, Sam Burden at UW and then our joint grad student, Ben Chasnov. <clears throat> and so we'll kind of just get into the weeds of it. I thought I would just talk about one specific thing versus like a you know, high level philosophy, mainly because I think some of this is, um, kind of exciting uh, new direction for us. So, okay, so let me just start with a little bit of the challenges and limitations to, to what people do in this space of, you know, you trying to come up with human decision models that can then integrate with reinforcement learning. Um, and so uh, some of the issues with uh, the current models for bounded rationality, in particular, those of uh, Harsani and others, um, is that they're not really amenable to computation. So these are the type of models where you have these nested probabilistic structures and they quickly get out of hand in terms of being able to uh, represent them in a way that can uh, that we can use um, in an algorithm. Um, on the other hand, the current models that are used uh, in reinforcement learning are sort of limited to these soft max style choice rules. Um, and the reason those are used is because we already have soft max style policies in reinforcement learning. And so it's just a natural thing to integrate those behavioral decision-making models into RL. Uh, but they're not necessarily, you know, experimentally validated or um, maybe not even the best predictive model for, for human behavior. It's just that they're easy to, to use. Um, on the other hand, many behavioral models that uh, are um, good at capturing things like risk, so say like those from prospect theory or some other bounded rationality models, they still lack experimental validation and in particular an optimization task in dynamic settings. So with these points um, in, in mind, um, Basically, the punchline of what I'm going to say uh, for this body of work that we have is that you know our goal here is to uh, come up with a uh, experimentally validated model for bounded rationality that can be integrated with existing 
techniques for um, uh, you know learning, in particular for re reinforcement learning, <clears throat> uh, when you have a human in the loop. And so essentially, we've leveraged this classical notion of an equilibrium concept that actually predates Nash. It's called a conjectural variations equilibrium. And we've extended it to be able to capture this sort of a, a layered approach to um, thinking about uh, um, yeah, bounded rationality, which I'll get into in just a minute. And it turns out it's extremely computationally attractable, has nice uh, interpretability in terms of trying to understand or interpret outcomes that you observe as being either collusive, competitive, or hierarchical. And there's some experimental backing in the, in the literature. And so our current results provide uh, experimental backing uh, in the context of human machine interaction. And we can show that it's pretty, pretty good at both modeling and predicting um, observed behavior. So let me just start with the actual equilibrium concept. So this is this old equilibrium concept that's existed for a long time. So we didn't come up with this. It um, was originally like an alternative to a Nash equilibrium, uh, but it had uh, several uh, criticisms and those are primarily uh, related to the fact that it's a, a dynamic concept to model really a static phenomena. And so people sort of move towards a Nash equilibrium, but I think this idea uh, which we'll see here in a second um, uh, of a conjectural variations equilibrium it naturally lends itself to thinking about layered reasoning. And so the idea is as follows. So you, let's say you have a game uh, between two players and we're going to do cost minimization here. And so each player has a cost function F1 uh, or FI, and it's a mapping from you know, their strategy space uh, cross with their, their competitor's strategy space, and it's a real valued function. Um, and so each player forms a conjecture about how their, the, their opponent will uh, respond to their either their action or their cost or strategy. You can kind of conflate cost and strategy uh, in some sense in, in, in this work. And so they can either conjecture based on what their information about uh, the actions they observe of their opponent or their knowledge of their um, cost function or strategy. And so in the center here, if you just think about conjectures based on actions, essentially the idea for conjectural variations equilibrium is that each player plays a best response uh, given that they believe their competitor is going to um, respond according to the, their conjecture. So of course, it might not be the case that the prediction, let's say for player, player one, uh, that it has about player two. So this, you know, y equals r2x as an example, that may not be equal to exactly what the second player is doing. So you have this issue of consistency um, in this notion of equilibrium. So to make sure that uh, these things are consistent, we have to add this extra constraint, um, which is shown here in this bottom box. So this is just to make sure that the conjectures that people have about um, each other are consistent in equilibrium with the actual behavior that the other, uh, other player executes. Okay. So then what we've done to, is taken this conjectural variations equilibrium and, as I mentioned, sort of incorporated this uh, k-depth best response. So this layered um, set of um, uh, reasoning uh, rules that allow us to um, define a differential notion of, of boundary rationality. So purely in terms of the derivatives of players' costs and uh, their conjectures. So just to relate it back to the equilibrium concepts um, that you guys may be familiar with. So we have um, at the very base level, what we call the null conjecture level, players do not believe their opponents are strategic and they simply play a best response. And that leads to the standard definition of a Nash equilibrium, which is just given here in the center of the slide as you know, uh, a best response. Um, if we allow one of the players to reason at the K, what we call the k equals zero level. So it has some conjecture about its component. And that conjecture is just that its opponent will do a best response. So let's let that be player one. And it believes player two is gonna play a best response. Then we end up with this set of optimization problems here at the bottom. And so this actually forms what's called a Stackelberg equilibrium. And the player one is the leader and player two is the follower. So player two simply does a best response, assuming nothing about player one and uh, player one plays a best response given that it believes player two is gonna play a best response. So these are two standard 
um, equilibrium notions that exist um, in the literature that you can capture with this conjectural variations um, concept. And so we can continue in this fashion and just keep nesting these best responses and we get various levels of, um, uh, of, the, of these conjectures for each player. And they can either be, again, uh, a, a mapping from a player's cost function, like at the k equals one level. So here, player two is conjecturing, um, uh, or sorry, player one is conjecturing that player two is gonna respond to this cost function F1, um, or it can be a, a conjecture based on an action. So like the k equals two level or the k equals zero level here. And so we can, without getting into a bunch of, more of the detail there, but just take that uh, nested level and you know keep iterating on it. We essentially arrive at this concept of a um, conjectural variations equilibria at the k l level. And so here, player one is reasoning at the k minus one level, and player two is reasoning at the l minus one level. And we can define an equilibrium using these uh, best responses given those conjectures. And so what's interesting here is that in the case where costs are quadratic, um, and this will be important for the experiments I'll show in a minute, all conjectures turn out to be affine functions because they're just, um, we'll see an example of this actually. So they're just derived from uh, the first order optimality conditions for each player's optimization problem. And that's just taking a derivative of a quadratic function, which will be an affine function. And then the variation of the conjecture, which is the derivative of the conjecture, is just going to be a linear map. So this means it's really easy to compute. Uh, and it turns out that this is the case no matter how many levels of conjecture you do, no matter how many iter like nestings of these um, best responses you do, all these conjectures will have this nice simple structure. The other interesting thing that's going to be important here is that the conjectural variations equilibrium at the k plus 1 k level is always consistent for the k plus one uh, player. That means that player never has an incentive to deviate because the behavior that it believes its opponent's doing is consistent with what that opponent is actually doing. And so um, we'll see why this is important in a minute because we'll see that actually in experiments, if the machine does a k level conjecture, the human always plays a k plus one level um, conjecture or plays a behavior that's consistent with it conjecturing uh, at a k plus one level. Okay, so I'll just give you know some of our preliminary experiments on testing this as a model to capture the interaction between humans and machines. So our our first uh, you know the, the experiment that I'll describe is pretty simple. So we just have um, a human who is tasked with minimizing a bar on a screen, um, and the height of that bar on the screen um, they have to minimize it by moving their cursor left and right. And the height of that bar on the screen is determined by uh, a cost function that's quadratic and depends on their own action, x, and then also the, the machine's action, uh, which is y here. And the machine's trying to uh, minimize its own cost. So we have a game between the human and the machine um, defined by these costs, ch and cm. Uh, and the way the machine is actually updating its action is according to a gradient descent. Um, and it plays gradient descent, um, not just following its individual gradient, meaning its derivative with respect to its cost, uh, with respect to its choice variable, so the explicit representation of its action and its cost, but also differentiating through its belief about the human. So the machine is conjecturing some conjecture, say R1, and so it believes X is going to be equal to R1 of Y. So then when it computes its gradient, it also has this extra term uh, in the update. Um, and it turns out again, because, um, which I'm not showing the details of, because the costs are quad quadratic, this just, this gradient of the conjecture just turns out to be a linear function L. I'll give an example in just a minute. Okay, I guess now. Um, so the, if you take, just to show why this is a linear map and, um, uh, you know, state that's generalizable to the higher order, if you have uh, a cost function that's quadratic, like the one at the top here, and let's say the machine uh, has the k equals zero level conjecture, so it believes the human's going to do a best response, then first order conditions for this optimization problem, min of cost 
uh, H, um, are just going to define uh, an implicit function that tells us how uh, what X looks like as a function of Y. So that's what R1 looks like. And you can see this is just a simple uh, linear expression. And so then the variation of this conjecture, so the gradient of this conjecture R1, is just going to be this linear map. And as I mentioned, um, using a tool from economics called comparative statics, it's actually not hard to show that all of these variations at every order are going to be uh, going to be linear. So then in our experiments, we essentially run this setup. So we fix the step size um, in the gradient update for the machine and the, the, the level of conjecture, which then fix, fixes um, basically L in that update for the, the machine. Um, and then we initialize the position of the cursor uh, uniformly between minus one and one so that we map that to the size, the width of the screen. And then we also um, uh, you know, initialize Y uniformly and then just sort of run this loop here where we display the cost uh, based on the actions of the, the human and the machine. Okay, so before getting into any uh, game experiments, we actually just check whether humans can minimize a quadratic function. And not surprisingly, if we just tell them there's no machine interaction at this point, they're just trying to minimize the simple quadratic function by moving their cursor, they can do that really fast. Um, you know, within five seconds, they get to the right, right value in general. <clears throat> so that's just a baseline task. And so then in our experiments, we want to vary the step size eta uh, for the machine and then the conjecture and see whether we can, um, you know, uncover which equilibrium the uh, humans go to. And if we can, then this leads us to a, a reasonable predictive model for how the, the human is going to respond given, uh, you know, whatever um, conjecture and step size the, the machine, the algorithm that we get to control is using. And so we have these quadratic costs as shown here at the top that we prescribe for you know, what's displayed to the human and then what is the internal cost to the, to the machine. And this is just one set of parameters that, that we used in our um, different experiments. And so we collect data on what's called prolific. It's a like research version of Mechanical Turk that recruits, like crowdsources people to do experiments. Um, and we have this, this uh, game that I, I described um, that we allow players to play for 40 seconds trials and then we collect this data um, to try to see what behaviors they're, they're executing. And so on the right hand side here, we, I'm just showing you the, the sort of landscape of equilibria for this game. So on the x-axis, this is the human's decision, y-axis is the machine's decision. And these lines are different best response curves for their cost functions. So their cost functions are quadratics. So the, um, obviously the best response will be lines here and the contours are um, ellipses. And so it, what you see is this blue guy here, this is the Nash equilibrium. This red guy is the human led Stackelberg equilibrium. So that's where the machine does the null conjecture. And then there's this sort of sw whole suite of conjectural variations equilibrium uh, for different levels of uh, uh, conjectures that leads to what's called the consistent conjectural variations equilibrium. So that's um, what I initially defined on one of the previous slides. And it's where the players are actually reasoning at a like k equals infinity level, essentially. So it's the limiting case. All right. <clears throat> so the first set of things that we do is we vary the conjectural variation itself and fix the step size to see um, what, what behaviors we observe. And it turns out that, interestingly, as I mentioned, humans always reason one layer deeper than the machine. And so <clears throat> if we fix the learning rate, and this, I'll, I'll explain what fast regime means in a minute, but essentially the learning rate is in the fast regime for the, the machine. Um, and then we vary the different conjectures. So the zero corresponds to the uh, null conjecture, and then 0 0.1 is reasoning at um, a, uh, a level of one. And then 0 0.5 is um, the machine reasoning at a level of k equals infinity, essentially, so the limiting case. And so what you see in this, this histogram plot is um, when, play, when the machine is reasoning at uh, some, say, level k, then 
the response of the human is consistent with k plus one. So as an example, for the case where the machine has the null conjecture, um, this red histogram is the human's actions. And you can see that it's um, sort, of, sort of concentrated around uh, the, stack of, the human led Stackelberg equilibrium, which corresponds to the CD at the one zero level. And then, you know, we, we run it at one layer, layer deeper and you get the response at the two one level and so on. So it's interesting because um, this is actually theoretically a consistent equilibrium for the humans. So they have no incentive to deviate. And it somehow suggests that in these simple tests, the human's just gonna do a simple best response. They're not gonna you know, waste any more effort to sort of reason any deeper than that. At least from a predictive perspective, like this seems to be a good predictive model. You can also look at the trajectories. Um, of the so the, these gray lines in here are just the different trajectories of humans moving their their cursor around, and um, you know if we just look at the trajectories for the case where we have the k equals infinity level conjecture for the machine, then um, the time averages of these trajectories actually concentrate along the best response curve for the human, corresponding to the CCVE equilibrium, so the consistent conjectural variations equilibrium which is you know, the one corresponding to this level of conjecture. You can see that with for the other conjectures as well, but uh, you know, I'll just move on for the sake of time. So the last set of things that um, we uh, kind of explore is now varying the, the machine step size and fixing the conjecture. And this has an interesting phenomena where <clears throat> you can basically, as you vary, um, even with a fixed conjecture, as you vary the the, uh, how fast the machine is learning, you move from the Nash equilibrium to the Stackelberg equilibrium. So it's saying somehow the rate at which the machine is learning is really important for sort of determining which is the equilibrium outcome you'll go to. So fast regime here is um, learning at a very high learning rate for the machine uh, and uh, a very, the slow learning rate regime is where the machine learns at a, a slow, a much smaller rate. So a smaller value. And on the right, you can see the histogram uh, for the human's action on the, which is the x-axis and the machine's action on the y-axis. And, and in the slow regime, they concentrate around the Nash equilibrium. Whereas in the fast regime, they concentrate around the human-led Stackelberg equilibrium. Um, so the, yeah, this sort of uh, suggests that this rate at which you learn, even with the same fixed conjecture, uh, determines what the equilibrium outcome is. So it's not just, the conjecture itself, but also the rate at which the machine is adapting that will determine what happens. Okay, so we can also sort of trace this out for a bunch of different learning rates and see that there's sort of a switch, there's a switch that happens. Um, so if we go from the slow rate to the fast rate, we switch from being at a Nash equilibrium slowly to a Stackelberg equilibrium. And we can check the gradients are consistent with uh, that information as well. I won't spend too much time on that just because we're running out of time here. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the last point is really probably that what humans are really doing is not actually following a gradient, but doing something more akin to a zeroth order algorithm, um, which means that they're querying their loss. They're seeing their loss function by querying and um, wiggling around the mouse, which you can kind of see in this top plot. So early on in the experiment, there's a lot of exploration and these are the gradients actually. And um, then towards the end, it gets to be a little bit less. You know, it's more concentrating around the um, around the specific value. And so, one way to model this in optimization is through a zeroth order algorithm, where you take uh, again a single query of your cost function and estimate uh, an unbiased estimator of a smoothed version of your loss function. Uh, and so, we can actually show theoretically that this type of algorithm exhibits the same kind of behavior. So they're in terms of like switching between Nash and Stackelberg. So there's a time scale separation parameter, which is the ratio of the uh, machine's uh, learning rate to the uh, human's learning rate. Uh, there's a value of that at which you basically switch from being um, converging to an epsilon ball around the Nash equilibrium to converging around an epsilon ball around the, the Stackelberg equilibrium. So this learning rate influences equilibrium play both in theory and in, in practice. All right, so I'll just finish up with this. So um, 
basically, the goal here was to come up with a simple predictive model uh, that can capture different levels of reasoning um, in uh, you know, observed human behavior and human machine interaction in a way that we can then um, later integrate this with um, more advanced reinforcement learning paradigms. And so specifically, because everything is captured in terms of a gradient uh, and gradient-like quantities, this is can easily be integrated with things like policy gradient methods and uh, even actor gradient methods for uh, reinforcement learning. So then when we're having like say humans and machines interact with each other, uh, these uh, models of how a human uh, reacts, so if we wanna have a predictive model for that, we can then use that in uh, our learning paradigm for the machine. Um, and so this is one step towards understanding that. We have some um, experiments now where we can actually influence the behavior uh, of the human as well by announcing particular conjectures and sort of driving them to uh, equilibrium. I didn't have time to talk about that, but that's uh, pretty interesting. And so next we're actually thinking about how to incorporate physiological signals and uh, other sensor motor signals, either through there's new in-ear EEGs now and like armband EEGs, which are really cool. Um, and so those taking that perspective that that information might tell us more about how humans are making decisions is sort of the next step that we're um, uh, going into. All right, so I'll just conclude with that. Hopefully I didn't go over too much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.